All right, we'll be taking our text this evening from 1 Thessalonians, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in verse 14. Uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, while you're uh, turning there, I will say that I had a wonderful time with Bible Believers Baptist Church out in Ohio, I mean Idaho, excuse me, had a good time, got to see the grandbaby, got to see the believers out there, and uh, the Lord really blessed. Uh, I learned this, and if you don't hear nothing else tonight, hear this, I saw a man standing just like I am like this, and two seconds later he was in full cardiac arrest behind the pulpit. Uh, life short. Be sure you're ready to go. Uh, and uh, the Lord blessed, and later that day, he was back in the services. Uh, that's what the Lord can do. Alright, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 14, Paul writing to the church at Thessalonica says, Now we exhort you, or encourage you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your watch care. Lord, we praise you for all that you do for us. Lord, we thank you for the traveling mercies that brought us uh, all the way across the country and back home again safely, Lord. We know it comes from you. Lord, we pray this evening that you would bless your holy word to the hearts of the ear. Lord, that you'd encourage us in this time that we stand today, a uh, very needy time among God's people, and we'd be... Uh, Standing in great need tonight of a move from you. Lord, help your people that are here. Lord, uh, pull the lost, draw the lost unto yourself. And we be faithful to give you the praise for it. For it's in Christ's name that we do pray. Amen. Now, Paul is ending his first letter to the Thessalonican believers and uh, was giving them some encouragement and some direct instructions in how that they were to continue on. Now, at this point, he probably really never thought about writing the second Thessalonican letter. And so, though, is, to his knowledge at the time, this was the last words that he would have for these people. So he begins in verse 14. Now, we exhort you or encourage you or beg you, brethren, warn them that are unruly. Now, through this, uh, this next few verses, you have to be sure you understand who Paul was talking to, who he was directing this at, and the first part is to the church of Thessalonica. And so, uh, in other words, there were going to be unruly people in the church, and that needed to be addressed. There were going to be people uh, causing, uh, causing some discontent from time to time, and that needed to be uh, dealt with by the church. Now, with that said, uh, we have no jurisdiction outside this body. We don't need to be trying to correct the world. Uh, you know what? The world is depraved and debauched, and it's going to go on downhill, and that's the way that God made it, and so we don't have an interest in that. But here in this place, in this little group of believers, we need to practice discipline. We need to practice what the Lord has told us to do. And so when we see somebody out there wearing a skirt that ought to be used for a dish rag, we need to say, hey, that shirt, that skirt is too short. When you see me, if you saw me running around in a dress, you'd say, Brother Larry, that's a problem with me, and we need to deal with it. And so uh, that's what he was saying. When you see issues, and, and those are real obvious issues, but you know what? After 20 plus years in the ministry, I can see when people are discontent too. Just as easy as I can see when, uh, uh, when someone's wearing a pair of short britches. So if they're discontent, it's my business to find out why. Why are you discontent? What the problem? What is the problem? And, and so he says, if you see this, go ahead and deal with it. Now we exhort you or encourage you, brethren, that you warn them that are unruly, comfort 
the feeble-minded. Now that feeble means weak or unable. Um, people that get, and, and you know, Paul wrote about this again and again and again. And apparently every new work had the same problem. Because remember, he wrote the Corinthian letter. I think he says, if it offendeth my brother to eat meat, I'll eat no meat. You know, and he went on to say that's a feeble thought that the that, that, that meat is dirty, but if it makes my brother to offend, I'm not going to eat meat. Same thing here. He says, listen, you comfort them. You don't bring them down. You don't, you, you don't mess them up. You comfort them right where they're at. Comfort the feeble-minded. And, and that's what we as the believers need to be. And again, all of this is still in addressing the church, not people outside the church. Support the weak. Now, that can be both ways. The weak in, in the church, people that are weak in their faith, people that get unsteady and upset when things are not going well. Or it can be as simple as children or, or people like Joey. Or support the weak. You give them what they need. You be a comfort to them. Be patient toward all men. Now, in the modern day, if there is anything that I have seen is the most difficult, is people being patient with other people. And we live in an instantaneous world, and in an instantaneous world, uh, uh, patience goes out the window because it's no longer necessary. But listen, in the things of God, just because you say boo, don't mean God's going to jump, and then you get back where there are patience that are necessary. We need to wait on the Lord. We need to wait... And when someone has offended you, you be patient with them. When there's a difficulty, you be patient with them and, uh, and, and support them all that you can. So he, uh, he says, you need to work on your patience. Uh, I think he said to the Galatian churches that that's actually a fruit of the Spirit. Being patient, giving time for things to happen. And so he tells them that. Verse 15. See that none render evil for evil unto any man. Now we get outside the church. Up to now he's been dealing with, with, with problems that would, would go on within the group. Now he's saying, you, you, you don't, just because he punches you in the right eye, you don't punch him in both. Even if he's outside the group. And you know what? That's a testimony to you, and not only is it a testimony to you, it's a testimony uh, of this church. And so he wanted them to have a good testimony outside, outside the believers in the group. He says, out there, you don't, just because they do something ungodly to you, you don't, you don't return that, and you don't do the same thing back. You be patient. You, you, you wait on that. And we as the Lord's people, sometimes in, in the wicked day that we live in, it's particularly very difficult to do this, but that is what we are expected to do. The rest of verse 15. But ever follow that which is good. That's a very tall statement, a very difficult thing to do. And that can be your thought for this week. That can be what you study for yourself. But ever follow that which is good. Uh, the last part of that says, both among yourselves and to all men. So in every situation, in the church, outside the church, always follow that which is good. Verse 16, rejoice evermore. Now, uh, to rejoice evermore means that you have to be happy with whatever situation you're presented with. With the good, the bad, the difficult, the happy, the sad, rejoice evermore. Now, in addition to rejoicing the circumstances, when, when difficulty arises, then you have to keep rejoicing. Because you see, if you follow the story of Job, the problem, you know, what, you remember what he said when he got the bad news? concerning the ten children. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord have given it, the Lord take it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And you know what? He started out rejoicing. But by the time his buddies had got there, the rejoicing was gone. And they brought him down even further, did they not? So, we are to rejoice evermore. Uh, even when we've had time to contemplate it. Even time, even when we've had to see, you know what? This is really kind of hopeless. I often think about Judy. 
And again, that kind of cancer was completely genetic. Do you know how likelihood, the likelihood of Jessica and Ashley getting something like that? That'd be hard to rejoice, wouldn't it? Yeah. Likelihood's really good. So, you know, but that, that is what we're called to do, right? You know, and so we as the Lord's people then, we need to really practice and focusing not on just rejoicing at the news, but as we live through a situation and we go on in the Lord that we continue rejoicing. Uh, verse 17, pray without ceasing. Now 17 helps you accomplish 16. If you are praying and you're looking for the face of God and, and you're in intercessory prayer with Him, 16 becomes a lot easier in the long run. Verse 18, in everything give thanks for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Now, if you star in your Bible, put you a big one right there. Because it says, in everything, give thanks. For this is the will of God concerning you. Now, a lot of people say, well, I don't know the will of the Lord right now. Well, I'm telling you just at least one, I can give you part of the picture, is that you need to be in that condition. Do I, know, do I know what you need to do? The next door you need to knock on? No. But I do know that is the will of God concerning you. We are to be that kind of people. We are to be that individual that rejoices about those things. Then, finally, I want you to get down to verse 19. And really is the focus of this evening's message. Quench not the Spirit. Now, I want you to notice two things. First of all, the, the, the last word of the Spirit there is concerning the Holy Spirit of God because it's capitalized, the Holy Ghost. Quench not the Spirit. Now, it's hard for me to wrap my little feeble mind around the fact of being able to quench or to bring down or, or, or to extinguish is exactly what that really means. A member of the mighty Godhead of all the, of all the world. Of all the universe. But I have to take in faith that it is possible. Because Paul wrote and said don't do it. So if he said don't do it. The, the, the ability for it to happen must be there. Now should that not make us as the Lord's people. Just kind of tremble sometime. To think that we could quench the mighty Holy Spirit of God. And probably. Of this happening in the histories 
in the history of the Lord's people. Uh, Joshua chapter 7 and verse 14. Joshua chapter 7 and, and verse 14. The Bible says, In the morning, therefore, and this is Moses speaking to his people. If you know your Bible, what had happened, they had their great victory at Jericho. They had their, their humiliating defeat at Ai. And now we're, we're dealing with the problems. You know, it is a wonderful thing, first of all, this. That, that from all his experience, Joshua had learned, at least from Moses, to deal with problems. And I also want you to notice this. He only knew there was a problem once they got in the battle. You know, sometimes that's the best way to find things out. Is God with me or is He not? And so they got out there in the little city of Ai and they, they ran like scalded dogs and, and Joshua knew that something was wrong and so they began, to, they began to pray about it and this was the solution at the hand of God. Verse Verse 14, In the morning therefore we shall be brought according to your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord taketh shall come according to families thereof, and the family which the Lord shall take shall come by households, and the household which the Lord shall take shall come man by man. And it shall be that he that is taken with the accursed thing shall be burnt with fire, and he and, and he and all he hath, because he hath transgressed the covenant of the Lord, and because he hath wrought folly in Israel. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, how sin was dealt with back then. When when they found out what what the issue was going to be and who was the instigator, they were going to die. Isn't it a, isn't it a wonderful thing of grace? Because you know what? That's how sin, that, that's how God Jehovah has always dealt with sin. The penalty of sin is death. Yeah. And, you know, these people that want to run the law back in, oh, I can keep the law and all that. Problem is, you know what? If you mess up, I'm going to take you out here and stone you. Let's keep the whole law. If you want to keep the law, let's keep the whole deal. And, and the next time you have an ungodly thought, we'll take you out there and stone you. How come they don't take in that portion of the law? That's the thing I've never understood. You never see anything with them. Uh, uh, that bunch wanting to do a stoning or anything, do you? See, you know what they want to do? They want to pick out what they want. See, that, that's just another uh, exhibition uh, of <laughs> how God, how, how people perceive God. They want to pick out what they want. And, and so we see then that th this was God's plan. They were going to deal with the problem. And the very next day they was going to stone the individual that was involved. Uh, verse 16. So Joshua rose up early in the morning and, and brought Israel by their tribes. And the tribe of Judah was taken. And he brought the family of Judah. And he took the family of the Zerites. And he brought the family of the Zerites, man by man. Zabdi was taken. And he brought the house of Hold man by man. And Achan, the son of Carmi, was the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah of the tribe of Judah, was taken. And Joshua said, uh, said unto Achan, My son, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. Make confession unto him, and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. Now, I want you to see that here we have a principle that sin has to be dealt with, and that it's also glorifying to God when the individual does deal with it. He says, you confess it. Give God the glory. Uh, you, you, you tell me exactly what has happened. You tell me, you, 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 for the people of Israel, you let them know what's going on. And you know what? That's how sin needs to be dealt with. It, it needs to be done in a specific way. It needs to be done. You know what? Uh, everybody always kind of gets down on me because I don't believe in double marrying preachers. Well, I don't. And the reason is stuff like this right here. See, sin has to be dealt with. Does it not? It, it, it's always been a, a, along that principle, has it not? And, and so we see that this individual huh, was known unto God's man. Achan hadn't said a word, but as soon as he stepped up, they came tribe by tribe and family by family. And no doubt, God said to Joshua's ear, that's him. That, that, that's your problem, man. And so he just says, Achan, you give God the glory. You, you tell me what you've done. Verse 
verse 20, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. Now I want you to see that, that uh, Achan had better understanding uh, of what he did than most people today. Because he says, I have sinned against God. You, you remember... Uh, you remember what David said when he finally got down to the point of admitting what he'd done to Bathsheba? He said, I have sinned against the Lord. That the very, the very exact same thing. So when we get out here and do these things, don't think that you're just impacting you. You're sinning against the Lord. That's right. You're sinning against the Lord because see, He's holy and clean and righteous. And we're, and, and we're bringing that filth unto Him. Uh, that, that's why it has to be dealt with. That, that, that's why it's necessary that sin, you know, <laughs> listen, it, it's very much a hindrance to us in the modern day. Verse 21, And when I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonian garment and 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them. Oh, well, he could have just controlled himself there. You know, uh, you're never going to stop singing. And you're never going to stop getting the idea of singing. Right. But listen, it'll be a, the mind of God's people who try to stop it before it happens. So he, he, he you know, uh, remember, remember what he says of concerning Eve in the very first sin? She was pleasant to her eyes and good for food. Now how did she know it was good for food? She thought about it. Because she hadn't had it yet, but she thought about it. She had contemplated, she had to look at it. Maybe it was similar to another fruit in the area. I don't know. But she had to think about this would probably taste really good. It'd probably be a very very feeling type of thing to eat. Let's try it. And, and so we as the Lord's people certainly ought to know that our minds run away with us at times, but we should always be very cognizant and stop before it gets to this point. But he didn't. Then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, <laughs> and the silver uh, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran into the tent. And behold, it was hid in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent and brought them unto Joshua and all the children of Israel and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all of Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver and the garment and the wedge of gold and his sons and his daughters and his oxen and his asses and his sheep and his tent and all that he had. And they brought it unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why have thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stones and burned, and burned them with fire. And, the, and, and, they, and after they had stoned them with stones, they raised up a great, a heap, a great heap of stones upon him unto this day. So the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger, wherefore the name of the place was called the Valley of Achor unto this day. So we see that that's how the Lord, the God Almighty, you see that, that Achan's actions impacted his relationship with God and it impacted his, the whole group's relationship with God. You know what? That will trouble us as the Lord's people that what you do and what you do and what you do impacts me and what I do impacts you. You know, it's a very humble thing when you decide that you want to unite with the church. And, and, and then when you are a member of the church, what you do can bring the church down. And so we as the Lord's people need to be very cognizant of that and, and, very, and very much prayerful that we actually add to the church and, and, and not bring it down. So that's how sin was dealt with. And that's, uh, that's how the Holy Spirit was, uh, was offended. So well, how do you know that? Well, He didn't help them in the battle, did He? They ran from a nation that wasn't even one hundredth the size of Jericho. And they ran like scalded dogs. See, uh, when you're not in the will of God, fear is always the result. You'll be fearful of the doctor's news. 
You'll be fearful of the phone ringing. You'll live in fear because you know you're not in the will of God. It's a terrible thing to live in fear. And you, you find a lot of so-called Christians today that that's their very, that's their very situation. And so uh, we find then that, is, uh, that we can quench the Spirit and the result sometimes is, is very, very difficult. Go with me to Acts uh, uh, in the New Testament now. Acts chapter number 5. Acts 5. In the very first verse. But there, but a certain man named Ananias was Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And kept back a part of the price, his wife also being privy to it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land. Now I want you to see something that this always uh, this scripture always points out to me that you can try to lie to God by lying to the person of the Holy Ghost, saying everything's okay when it's not is a lie. Do you ever think about that? And a lot of people are saying in this day and age that we live that everything's all right between me and God. Everything's all right between me and the church. It couldn't be more hunky to the door. But what they're doing is lying to the Holy Ghost. And then when you get into problems like these two did, they wonder why what happened. See, um, the thing in the story with Ananias and Sapphira, Really, they weren't really obligated to give any of that to the Lord except their time and their honor. But they wanted to look big eyed to the rest of the group. See, that was an unusual day of the church. About the first two years of the Lord's church there at Jerusalem, they lived as a commune. And they were all together and they shared each other's expenses and they, they shared each other's food. And I guess it, just because the flesh of what is what the flesh is. They got really wanting to, oh, you know what? I'm going to, uh, you know, want to impress everybody with how much money they contributed to the general fund. And that's what this was all about. Wanting to look like somebody big. Wanting to, wanting to, wanting to be somebody uh, that they weren't. And so they, they caught up this plan in their mind. And I want you to see that the Holy Ghost was very aware of it. Verse 4, while it remained, was it not thine own? And after it was so, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived to this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came unto all men that heard these things. Now, I want to get, you know, well, we know that the Lord's time for Ananias and Sapphira had arrived, but. Have you ever thought it was such a, uh, you know, I don't know if Ananias and Sapphira were saved or not. I don't know their, their soul's condition. But did you ever think that maybe it hit full home with Ananias that I have lied to God. I ain't lied to the church. I lied to the almighty God of the Bible. And it was so overwhelming for him, it killed him. You know, if that's the case, I'd have to I'd have to respect Ananias maybe just a little bit because that shows he, he respected God probably more than I do. He had a godly fear about him. He had a respect, a godly respect for the things of God. If that's true. So we find that he hits the ground. About two hours later, they come in, Sapphira tells the same tale, and she's the next to go. You know what? That 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 will put a little fear in our hearts. That 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 you know that that our behaviors can be impacted. You know, I think that sometimes what we do, we we want to minimize the person of the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Ghost. You know, I fully believe He could take a life because you know what? He's part of God. Is He not? You would have to reach that conclusion. 
And so we as the Lord's people, certainly in the modern day, we don't want to do anything in our behaviors, anything in our actions, the things that we say, the things that we would do to quench the Spirit. Because certainly He can be. He can be quelled down. Things can be going well. And something that someone does can quench the Spirit and change the whole tone of what's being done. And, and I certainly know this because I've seen it in my own mind and, and, and in my own life and ministry that the Holy Spirit is quenched. Will His ultimate purpose be accomplished? Sure it will. If not, He's not God. But you know, I see a lot of people of dry, needy Christians in the modern day. Just like the Sahara Desert. And I think a whole lot of it is the quenching of the Spirit. I really do. Why, why are the Lord's people so discouraged, so down and out, so tired and weary? Well, I, I think the active member of the Godhead that's here with us is being quenched. We don't hear from Him. We're not encouraged by Him like we should be. And all it takes is His people... To be obedient. His people to follow what he would have us to do. Last place I'm going to read this evening in the book of 2 Corinthians. Very familiar verse of scripture. But I want to include them. Uh, give you something to think about. In different ways that we might quench them. 2 Corinthians 6 verse uh, 14. 2 Corinthians 6 and verse 14. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now that yoke can be lots and lots of different things. A yoke is always something you're put into and connects you to somebody else. You can be connected by covenant. You can be connected by family. You can be connected by where you work. Lots and lots of ways to be connected or yoked up. Some of them are deliberate and some of them are not. But I will say this. If you're having spiritual issues because of your job, it's time to get a new job. If you're having spiritual issues because of your family, you can't get a new family, but you can distance yourself. And I've had to at times over the years. And, you know, it's hard, but sometimes it just has to be that way. <coughs> Being unequally yoked is not what the Lord would have for His people at any, any time because it always results in that quenching of the Spirit and, and, and the results are never good. Be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship have righteousness with unrighteousness. And, and you know, that is a question that should be answered and it always should be answered this, none, not a, no, zero. But you know what? In the modern day, this is the problem is that we do have reasons to fellowship on them. We do have reasons. And, and, and you know, every time that we do that, it brings the Lord's church a little bit colder, a little bit more difficult, a little bit drier when you go to the next service. And when you about come to the point that's all we expect. That, that we think, hey, that's par for the course. But it ought not to be among God's people. We ought to be glad and happy um, when we have to give something up for the Lord Jesus. Notice what he says in verse 15. He asks more questions. And what concord, which is literally a written agreement, and what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And again, the, the uh, unbelieving answer ought to be none, nothing, nothing. There's no concord or agreement there. And I don't need to do uh, too much detail in this, but maybe one day someone will click on this and listen to it. I had a friend when I was in nursing school years ago at UT Martin, and this young lady was a member of a sorority. You be very, very careful whether you believe it or not. That is a covenant that you're going into. And one of the initiations to this particular sorority, you laid in a casket and you burst out as a new. You know what that is? That's blasphemous. I mean, that they are trying to liken or uh, mimic what they think the new birth is. You know what? Uh, whether the, that group, and I don't, that's about the only thing I know. I've never heard anything about the Pratt. I don't know nothing about 
talking about meeting this girl was real good friends and we talked about it. You know what? That's a covenant relationship and she better get out of it. God's people don't need to be named among that stuff. It, it, it's, not, it's not our business. We don't have anything involved in that. That's temporal. That's ungodly. It's of this present world. And that's exactly what he's uh, talking about. And what agreement have the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them. And I will be their God. And they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord. Touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. Now, I'll leave you this. If you believe that, you have to believe a flip side of that, would you not? I won't receive you. Right? Now, I'm going to talk about losing your salvation. But I am saying this. Living such an ungodly life that the Holy Ghost don't meet with you. You don't have any sweet contentment. You don't abide in peace. I believe that's a fulfillment of this, do you not? See, if you don't understand the person of the Holy Spirit, I'll go this far that you're probably lost. If you don't understand the preciousness of His presence, you're probably lost. You probably need to be born again. And if you don't Treasure that. You know, what, what times I spend along with the Lord is worth all the any kind of effort that I put into it. And if you don't treasure the presence of the Holy Spirit, something is terribly, terribly wrong. And if you don't know what I mean when I say that, you've probably never been born again. Make your calling and election sure.